So, um, good afternoon. I'm Nancy Hensel, and I am president of the New American Colleges and Universities. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to hear from our students. Um, first of all, I want to thank Representative Jim Cooper for arranging for this space for us and his um, legislative aide, uh, Justin Tooley. And I don't think Justin is here yet. No. So anyway, but we do appreciate very much the folks from Nashville, Tennessee, helping us with this um, space. The New American Colleges is a consortium of 25 uh, colleges and universities around the country. We represent 16 different states. Um, and our members are committed to the integration of liberal arts, professional studies, and civic engagement. And we think that's the best approach to preparing students for lives of meaning and career achievement. And we have a panel of students today um, who are going to talk about their experience and how they're beginning to lead, lead, well, they've been leading lives of meaning for a long time, but professional in, uh, lives of meaning uh, based on the experiences that they've had at their colleges and universities. Um, our panel will be moderated by Richard Ekman. Many of you in the audience probably know Richard. He's been president of the Council of Independent Colleges since 2000. And he has been a strong and very effective voice um, advocate uh, for the liberal arts education for both our students and for the benefits of the liberal arts education for our society at large. So um, very appreciative that he was able to be with us today and to moderate this panel. I just want to take a moment to introduce our students. Um, first of all, we have Samantha Hubner, who is from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And there are seats in front if anybody wants to come up front. Um, and she is a senior majoring in political science. And after graduation, she's going to tell you about her really great experiences she's had during her education. But after graduation, she's going to spend a couple months in Morocco. <laughs> I think it'll be warmer than it is here <laughs> in Washington, D.C. today. And then she's going to be going on to graduate school and hopes eventually to be with the Foreign Service. Um, next to um, Samantha is Evan Melgren, and Evan is an advertising and public relations graduate of Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. And he, Evan has served as the communications co-chair of a project that Drury did this year um, uh, with um, uh, the solar, what is it, the solar marathon. Um, decathlon. decathlon, I mean, yes. <laughs> well, it was a marathon, too, I think, yeah, from talking with the people when I visited their, <laughs> um, their site in San Diego. But they built a solar home that is uh, disaster resistant. And some of you may remember that St. Louis. Um, Joplin. Joplin, right, thank you. Didn't have that written down. Joplin, Missouri had a very serious tornado that killed a number of people and really devastated the city. And so they built this home that will resist tornadoes. So it was a very exciting um, project. And next to Evan is Peter May, who is a recent graduate of the University of Evansville in Evansville, Indiana. And Peter was participating in the Institute for Global Enterprise at Evansville. And as part of that experience, he served as an international um, consultant, marketing consultant for um, berry plastics. Yeah, it wasn't coming to me, berry plastics. And, um, and I guess he now is employed uh, uh, with the Rush Soccer Club in Denver um, after graduating and plans to go into graduate school. And I forgot to mention, Evan, that you're also employed <laughs> at Killian Construction as a research uh, marketing analyst and branding specialist. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Rich. So uh, let's welcome Rich Ekman. Thank you, Nancy, and uh, welcome to all of you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I remember when the New American Colleges and Universities were just getting off the ground many years ago, and it, back then it was quite controversial to think that a college or university could excel in both the liberal arts and professional studies simultaneously. And all of your members have done that extremely well, 
and now there's a third leg on the stool which is civic engagement and to judge from the career so far of these three uh, young people you hear from in a minute the third leg has been as integral to the success of uh, your university educations as as the other two legs of the stool. Uh, NACU is something of a bellwether, I believe, for all colleges and universities in calling attention to the interrelationship of these three essential components of uh, higher education. Now, at my organization, the Council of Independent Colleges, which includes more than 600 private colleges and universities, we've been engaged in an effort to make the case for just this kind of education as well over the past few years. And we've done it through some techniques that you would all find familiar, but some that you would not find familiar. When we started this campaign three years ago, we thought, I thought, I'd be spending a lot of my time talking to reporters in traditional media, writing op-ed pieces myself, and giving speeches. Hasn't turned out that way. What's been most instrumental has been first to collect video testimonials from recent graduates of our colleges and then to introduce those into the social media. Now, I'm an old guy. I don't know much about social media. But luckily, we have had on our staff for the past few years a young woman who is here today, Cecily Garber. Where is Cecily? Cecily is an ACLS public fellow, and she is Art and Libby, for those of you who followed our campaign. So if you go to our uh, website or you tweet and you see Art and Libby in action, it's Cecily who's doing it. But the, uh, the case that we've tried to make and uh, is that bringing together these different elements in the lives of college students leads to a result that is just unbeatable. And the track record of young people who had the benefit of an NACU education has been remarkable. Did I understand correctly, Nancy, that all three of these individuals are employed? Not, but she, she will be. Samantha says she has an internship that pays her right now, it does. And um, you know, the statistics show that the graduates of NACU and other private institutions have a remarkable track record. The, uh, the media hype about liberal arts graduates not getting jobs just isn't true if you look at the statistics. And the uh, record of the graduates of these institutions and training leaders for their own communities, people who vote more and give more to charity and do all kinds of things that show that civic engagement taken seriously is quite remarkable as well. There is in your folder a flyer about this campaign that my organization has been running and I hope you'll look at it and go to the website if you want to learn more. But now I think it's time to turn to our three speakers who will tell us a little bit about their own educations, the particular projects they've been in, and I hope that in that you will see the inner relationship of their study of the liberal arts, professional studies, and civic engagement. Now, who wants to go first? If I call on Samantha first, then I'll be accused of being a sexist. <laughs> if I call on her last, who knows what I'll be accused of. So Samantha, you're first. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out today. I really appreciate um, the support that we've received, not only as a member of this conference, but just as a student who's getting to see just how far um, the network can reach um, all the way out to DC. As um, Nancy mentioned, we are at Nashville, Tennessee. That's where um, our university is. And it's been a real pleasure to come out to DC during the school year to kind of get to engage with a different type of, um, just a different type of environment. Um, it's nice to be back too. Um, the world that we live in is an increasingly complex entity. And I think that in a place like this, we can all agree that it's becoming increasingly important to understand the interconnectedness of the world as it's becoming more complex. Because the way that we relate to people, not only across disciplines, but across nations, is it's increasingly uh, significant in the way that we go about our jobs. Whether it's uh, more specialized, more generalized, you really do need to have a handle on more than just one area of expertise. And I think that really gets down to the value of a liberal arts core um, 
just as our moderator was explaining, um, those three legs, when you can encompass all three of those, that's when you can really ensure that you're going to be successful as you embark on your future career. I think all three of us can kind of attest to that as we're getting ready to take those next steps into the world. Um, I am here to talk today a little bit about the research I did in China. I was part of the Asian Network Student Faculty Fellowship with the Freeman Foundation um, for the summer of 2014. I went to China with one of my professors. Uh, there were three other students with me and what we did was we decided to um, take a look at China's new cultural industry, which, take, take a second, new cultural industry. That's, that's a different terminology than you're used to, I'm sure. Um, I know it took me a second to really understand what that meant. Um, so what we did, um, we were taking the knowledge that we four students had accumulated um, through our different areas of expertise. All four of us came from very different backgrounds. I, um, as Nancy mentioned, I'm a political science major with minors in French and Chinese. And then two of the other students were international business, one with a focus in marketing and the other with a focus in entrepreneurship. Uh, and the third student was a comparative philosophy and Asian studies major. Altogether, we had that unifying factor of Chinese history and Chinese language. But beyond that, we were coming together as a team to really get a full dimensional approach at this question we were trying to answer and looking at what are cultural industries, what is China doing with this, and how is that going to look in the future. Um, so in embarking on that, when we got to Beijing, we started out at Beijing University um, to get an idea of what the theoretical engine, the academic framework behind all of it, what, what did that look like? Um, because it was important to understand what the goal was before we were looking at the actual execution. So we went and we met with professors at the Institute of Cultural Industries, which was a very enlightening experience. We learned that our project was kind of named incorrectly. There isn't just one <laughs> cultural industry, there are many. And it's important to know that before you go in trying to explain what these huge, huge things are, these huge initiatives. <laughs> There's more than one, get excited. So we got that taken care of and we got a really um, solid understanding of what we were in for. Um, they had a really interesting model um, where they looked at um, how they were identifying the audience, how they were engaging with the government in terms of resource allocation and not just financial either. Um, people, um, how private investment was working toward that, looking at how that all comes together to create these theme parks, really, um, about Chinese culture. So what we did, we went to these theme parks and we administered surveys to foreign nationals, um, asking them, you know, explaining in Chinese, like, this is what we're doing, we're looking to see, like, what do you think of this cultural industry, this advertising of Chinese culture and history as a commodity. Um, we all have seen the boom of China's economy and the commercialization that they're kind of becoming trademarked for now. Um, and then looking at that and how that applied to these, you know, their, what I would call as a political science major, domestic soft power, um, seeing how the public responded to that was absolutely fascinating. We found that, you know, they're more willing to sell their classical Chinese literature as their true history, um, professing the same values as the facts, but at the same time, they're more quick to direct you to the literature than the actual historical events which was really fascinating. It's something that we're still working with now, um, trying to get some stuff together, hopefully for publication, maybe for some of the travel journals. Um, but in looking at that in the context of this panel, this was the first time that I, as a student, had the opportunity to take what I had been learning in the classroom and put it to use, to give it that, that professional uh, that execution. Uh, so in doing that, um, it was really, really helpful to rely back on the core that I had received from the honors curriculum at Belmont. Uh, we have an honors program that really focuses on interdisciplinary learning and kind of like what our moderator was just mentioning, civic engagement. We have a track specifically designed to help students engage with the community, applying what they've learned as part of the senior project. It's very, very cool thing that is very unique to the honors program, especially as an interdisciplinary program that really encourages you to take what you know and what you understand and what you've learned throughout your life and put a new spin on it, put a new comprehensive spin on it that will 
really challenge you to see the world in a new way. That is what has made all the difference to me. It, you know, it really pushed me to aim a little higher, and that was what encouraged me to put forth an application to the State Department uh, this past fall, um, two summers. Well, last summer, two falls ago. Kind of confusing. But I figured, you know what? If I can do research in China, why can't I come to DC? And, you know, it's that kind of an attitude when you can get right down to it, if you can get that confidence just to try, if you can push forward to get that opportunity, to create that opportunity for yourself, that your faculty and that your programs at these universities, these colleges that clearly have the priorities to make you their priority, to invest in you, if you can take advantage of that, that's where you can find the success. I ended up working at the State Department all of last summer. I still currently work for the State Department as a virtual intern for an embassy in Africa. And um, like I mentioned to our moderator, I'm currently working at the Tennessee Capitol as well. So there's a lot out there and a lot that you can do, but a lot of those opportunities were only afforded to me because of the education I received at a liberal arts university with an emphasis on all of those things, on professional expertise, on civic engagement, who are going to push you forward. And so in sharing that and what I've done with you today, I just hope that you can really resonate with that, um, with me on that, to understand the importance of what it is that we do and why it's important that we meet here today to talk about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. What a, an exciting opportunity. I, I've uh, thought of a dozen questions I want to ask you, and the members of the audience, I'm sure, have them as well. I thought what we might do is hear from the three speakers and then ask some questions and then try and involve everyone in the discussion. There are lots of public policy implications for what you just said. All right, who's next? Peter, great, okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Peter May, and I'm a recent graduate from the University of Evansville, which is located in Evansville, Indiana. Um, at the University of Evansville, I studied political science and business administration while also competing as a member of the Purple Aces men's soccer team. Uh, I'm going to start by saying what an honor it is to be invited to this event and how humbling it is to be speaking in front of you guys. Um, for that, I'd like to thank the NAC and you, Nancy and Michelle, you guys have done so much, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I'd also like to thank the University of Evansville. Again, it's such an honor to be able to represent my alma mater here and to share with you a little bit why um, attending the University of Evansville has been one of the most impactful decisions of my young life. I grew up around college. Um, my family moved to Bowling Green, Kentucky when I was just three years old because my father had taken a job as a geology professor at Western Kentucky University. I saw and heard about the daily functions of a state school of over 20,000 students, and I can't tell you how much I fell in love with that. Uh, Fifteen years after moving to Bowling Green, I graduated from Bowling Green High School. My father was still a professor at that same university, and almost all of my childhood friends were going to the school that I had come to so love. I was one of the few who did not, choosing instead to take the two-hour journey up the Natcher Parkway to attend a small liberal arts school of just over 2,000 students. At that time, I was going to the University of Evansville for one thing, to play Division I soccer. <laughs> what I didn't realize was that I was in for so much more. It wasn't until the completion of a semester-long project for a local company in my senior year that I realized how different my college experience had been from all of my buddies that attended Western Kentucky and other large state universities. This project that I speak of was a culmination of every aspect of the liberal arts experience put into one, which is why I was finally able to pull together all of the experiences I had had to that point. I will try and unpack this for you by looking at three separate themes, all of which will prove to be connected in the end of this talk. Hopefully I can paint the picture of my aha moment for you all. The first theme is that of opportunity. My opportunity came in the form of the University of Evansville's GAP program. To participate in the program, you must apply or be nominated by a professor. From there, you are put on a team that you'll work with for the entirety of semester. Now this sounds like a pretty normal uh, honors type project, but what is unique about GAP is that anyone from any major can be nominated or can apply to be in the program. Each team is then paired with a company and is expected to 
provide value on a project that the company defines. Again, this sounds like a pretty normal type of group project, but this is where GAP really sets itself apart. The value provided for the company comes from the teams acting as hired consultants by the company. That's to say the teams are given little more than a task with no guidelines other than what should be included in their presentation at the end of the semester. And then they get to work. My GAP team was made up of five members, an archaeology major, a sports communications major, a graphic design major, an accounting major who is also Indonesian, and myself, a political science and business major. We were paired with Fortune 500 manufacturer Barry Plastics, which is one of the world's largest producers of plastics packaging whose headquarters are conveniently located in Evansville. Barry requested us to conduct an analysis of, in, of the Indonesian consumer packaged goods market and provide them with a recommendation as to whether they could penetrate that market successfully. From there, we got to work. This is pretty vague, but that's the extent to which I can discuss this because we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement with Barry Plastics. Uh, I wish I could tell you a little bit more. Uh, but. What I can tell you is that the project was full of challenges and headaches, and we found ourselves spending double the amount of time on GAP than we were on the rest of our schoolwork. That effort was well worth it in the end. At the end of the semester, we presented our report in a boardroom to top company executives who used our research strategy in the formulation of their actual corporate level strategy, which was awesome to hear, and it really made you feel great about the work that you put in. That's when I realized that through this opportunity that I was provided from my own hard work and the help of others that I could make a global impact. A few of my buddies at other schools had been afforded an opportunity at, an, at the undergraduate level. Now as my team researched, we were met with obstacle after obstacle all semester long. We did have the help of two research employees at Barry and our project leader, but for the most part they could only guide us because like I said, it was our work and it was our research. All the various areas of study and different backgrounds allowed us to leverage diverse skills to help one another through these tough times. Originally I thought, how in the world is an archaeology major going to be able to help me in this business project? This is where we can see the second theme, the importance of building diverse relationships. Because without the culmination of different perspectives, our team would have been totally stuck. On this multidisciplinary team, we could not only delegate responsibilities, but also ensure that all biases were accounted for when we met as a group. The relationships built through considering and interpreting different perspectives turned a group of strangers into a team where everyone had value. This is when I understood why I had to take those seemingly useless general education classes and how I could use those insights gained to help me in my future. The liberal arts education system teaches us how to create relationships with others by considering and learning from the brilliance and the difference of perspectives. That's what the so-called real world is, I think. It's about establishing relationships with people, learning from one another's experiences, and working together to meet a common goal. The first step to that is accepting the benefit that can be provided from a unique perspective. As can be seen by many current issues, both domestic and abroad, narrow-mindedness can be a very dangerous thing. Learning to take time to consider and break down differences and eliminate misperceptions can do so much good on so many levels whether it be at my university, in a conference room at Berry Plastics, or in our everyday lives. My liberal arts background helped turn this theme from a thought process into a habit. All people have something to give to you if you're willing to listen. And the third theme, which I think is the most important, ambiguity, we will see everything tied together. The ambiguity of our opportunity is what established the grounds for the fostering of diverse relationships and success of our group. I found this to be a common theme over my time at the University of Evansville. It just took this project to bring that to light. The project did this because there was no syllabus explicitly telling us when to have assignments done by. When we got to a checkpoint, we had to dig back in. I have experienced this in a couple of my summer internships as well, and my bosses were always very happy with my ability to look for the next step once I finished one. This is a skill that I believe is easily transferable to any career down the road. Ambiguity can be an extremely frustrating thing, and it most certainly was during the project. But the thing that I've come to appreciate about ambiguity is that it inspires us to be curious in so many different ways. The ambiguity of the project forced us to be curious about one another, which helped build, our, which helped build relationships that were so important to the success of our team. That is, able, that is how we were able to identify each person's role in the group. 
The lack of guidance forced us to be curious about the plastics industry, which isn't that exciting. Forced us to be interested in the culture of Indonesia, and all of that curiosity made us care about what we were doing. Ambiguity no longer scares me. I now see it as an opportunity to build relationships and to learn. Whether it is working on a project or going to a country that you have never been to before, it enables you to be curious and it forces you out of your comfort zone. I was able to pick my path through college. Sure, I had to meet some general education guidelines, but for the most part, I was able to take those classes because I was interested in the subject matter. I learned so much more because of this. I was able to interact and build relationships with so many different classmates and professors of different backgrounds, and I realized my appreciation for the arts, and I also developed the ability to interp interpret things from a variety of perspectives. That, more than anything, is what I have loved about the University of Evansville. And as you hear the rest of my colleagues speak with me today, I think that's pretty common across the spectrum of liberal arts colleges and universities. You are pushed to be curious by the institution, but from there you're able to create your own path. This curiosity that I speak of is so important because from curiosity comes passion. Everyone talks about finding passion, but what they don't realize is that you have to go look for it. This curiosity allows you to become passionate. I never would have thought that I would be passionate about the plastics, pla plastics packaging industry, but boy did I ever become that way. It was a pretty universally accepted concept that passionate people are the most successful in what they do. I think that's the value of a liberal arts education. You are taught how to become passionate through your own curiosity. Thank you. Your aha moment, Peter, at the University of Evansville reminded me of uh, what a friend of mine, John Wilson, the president of Morehouse College, is fond of saying, quoting Mark Twain, that there are two important dates in your life. There's the day you were born and the day you figure out why. And that apparently came for you at the University of uh, Education yourself. That's terrific. Evan, you're up. You're up. Okay. Hello. Thank you all for coming. We all really do appreciate it. It seems these days, doesn't it, that there is limitless knowledge available to us. Knowledge, of course, has always been available for those that sought it, but what seems different now is the stunning ease with which we can access it. You can verbally address your own cell phone and receive a prioritized list of answers from the best educated sources around the world. You can, uh, I, in college, my papers were informed by current peer-reviewed articles from the best educated sources also around the globe. As wonderful as this access has been, I think it can also be uh, encouraging to become overconfident in our hyper-informed opinions that result from it. What is knowledge without a little wisdom? A child, even if given all of the world's knowledge, would not make prudent decisions. Today we're here on behalf of the liberal arts style of education as a route to create wiser graduates. I myself received such an education, an education that provided a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to participate in the U.S. Department of Energy's solar decathlon, which directly resulted in a job. I'd like to use my time in front of this audience to make clear the similarities between the solar decathlon and the liberal arts approach, how my own liberal arts education helped prepare me for employment in the modern economy, and how invaluable its inherent structure was to securing that employment by creating a well-rounded and dynamic problem solver. Firstly, a little background on the Department of Energy's competition itself. The Solar Decathlon is a two-year-long endeavor designed to prove the viability of solar energy. It provides college students the opportunity to design, market, create sponsorship deals, actually build, and then operate solar-powered homes in a competitive format. All homes must be transported to the competition site, where teams must give tours to the public and be tested by decathlon officials. Teams must first submit their design, and of the 140 teams from around the world, only 20 were accepted to the 2015 competition, which creates that kind of rarefied air that is extremely conducive to, con uh, to innovation. Teams are often, although not necessarily, composed of partnerships between an engineering and a design school, as was the case for our institution. 
Schools do this not only to pool donor bases, but also to create the kind of left brain, right brain partnership needed to create something that's beautiful, not only in its design, but in its efficiency. Building these extraordinary homes is no small feat for a student. It requires intensive critical and creative thinking, and then forces students pursuing specialized degrees to communicate their ideas to others, much like they have to in an organization. The Solar Decathlon is divided into 10 areas of competition, and each is worth 100 points. So the communications contest is just as important as the architectural or engineering competitions. And that's what makes it such a unique STEM competition. Naturally, the opportunity to develop and implement solar and passive technological innovations draws in exceptional scientific minds. But the fact that the decathlon grounds its contestants with competition areas like affordability, comfort zone, and marketability ensure that the designs meet real world needs. Our team, composed of students from Drury University and Crowder College, was unique in that it took a whole school approach throughout the entire process. Crowder College has been designated by Missouri Legislature as the state's renewable energy education center and has been a pioneer for renewable energy. Their expertise in solar energy has been tapped by interest groups from around the world. My own alma mater of Drury University brought architectural design, communications, and marketing to the table. Our architectural school brought a humanitarian design perspective and experience with lead design standards. Thus, from the beginning, our designs and actions were formed by a group of students with diverse backgrounds and educations. This method produced interesting and robust solutions that I'll go into now. Students and faculty from both of our schools were involved in the recovery efforts when our neighboring town of Joplin, Missouri was destroyed by an EF5 class tornado. And from that firsthand experience with tragedy, we drew our inspiration. We knew that we wanted our home to be not only solar powered, but also able to resist the 200 plus mile per hour wind speeds and the resulting projectiles that ripped Joplin to shreds. Our solutions were pragmatic, a thicker wooden framework, reasonable steel reinforcement to anchor the roof to the foundation, folding storm doors, and redundant layers of cladding to protect the home from impalement. All within a clean and modern design that conveniently eliminated footholds for wind. All of those resistant features and more were only a part of our design, however, as we also created our home, which we titled Shelter Cubed, to uh, serve as easily transportable disaster relief housing in its first phase and to conveniently expand into a permanent home as the community recovers. As the voice for this project, it was, ex it was exciting to see a design come together that exemplified harmony between design and engineering. It would have been easy to create a concrete bunker without any windows, just as it would have been easy to create a home so beautiful and ostentatious in its design that it would have had no practical employment. I think it was because of our liberal arts attitudes that we saw the merit in a strategy that encompassed both perspectives. I myself came on board as a video producer, and as the demands of the project stacked up, I took on the role of communications chair, in charge of our entire communication strategy, which included a website, social media and community management, video and photo production, PR outreach, and more. To successfully handle these responsibilities necessitated an understanding of solar engineering, architectural concepts, and construction practices that pushed me to apply what I'd learned in my communications coursework and solidify it into concrete actions. For myself and my teammates, it was that solidification that was one of the biggest lessons that we took out of our experience as decathletes. I'll never forget the wake-up call that I had when working on the brand concept for our home. It was a team endeavor, and yet I went in with a very clear idea of what it should look like. I learned very quickly that in order to be a leader on the team, I'd have to absorb the feedback from my teammates and quickly synthesize answers that were not only sound for the project, but also kept my teammates feeling respected and engaged. Coming together in weekly meetings, forming a group consensus, ensuring that we were unified in our mission and all on the same page, practicing our leadership skills, these are the opportunities that myself and other team leaders return to when we look back. When I speak with fellow alumni of Drury, it is always with gratitude that we marvel at how well the interdisciplinary nature of our education prepared us for our workforce. But don't just take my word for it. Drury's statistics speak for themselves on that front. Less than 3% of our graduates are still looking for employment six months after graduation. 
For me, employment came after a general contracting firm saw some of the video that I produced and learned that I'd had to learn some architectural modeling software on the fly in order to do so. After, in, after interviewing with them, they extended an offer to come on board as a marketing res market research analyst and branding specialist. It's worrying to me, though, as a young professional to hear language coming out of the current political landscape that dismisses educations like mine, which included foreign language and cultural exploration, statistical analysis, writing, politics, communications, and yes, philosophy. At Drury, our curriculums are intentionally designed to overlap each other. Students are encouraged to seek parallels and overarching themes. As I earned my science credit with an ecology course, I learned about niche ecosystems and later wrote about the similarities between nature segmentations and market niches in an economy. Is any of that actually useful, though, in the modern economy? I may be young, but it seems that everywhere I turn, the answer is yes. For example, I was able to find in both Time and Forbes articles making very clear the need for philosophy majors in the tech industry, and I actually think that makes perfect sense. If there's nobody asking why and only how, then what kind of success do you think a product or service could possibly have? As deep as the respect is that I have for the engineers and scientists in this country, I know from personal experience that it's easier for some of them to miss the forest for the trees than they might like to admit. Enter the liberal arts major. Their degree could be in anything from chemistry to 19th century American literature. But no matter what, they'll come from a background of study that forced them to confront their own prejudices and assumptions through the study of culture and thus have a deeper understanding of what motivates not only themselves, but others. You'd be hard pressed to find a student from Drury who lacked that moment in their education where they truly got outside of their own perspective and connected with the bigger picture. In that same way, it would be difficult to find a decathlete who had not realized the importance of the work done on their home by other students. Through the liberal arts educations, Americans will not only obtain critical, career-specific knowledge, they'll gain the larger perspective needed that will ensure that our culture maintains a direction that is fulfilling in all the ways that we crave. It's been fruitful for me, for my fellow solar decathletes, and countless others. So please do not dismiss the liberal arts. Thank you. Thank you, Evan, and, and thanks for the reminder that the sciences and mathematics are also part of the liberal arts. In fact, the, again, to the statistics, the statistics show that NACU colleges and other smaller private institutions have a much higher percentage of students who start out with science majors who eventually get bachelor's degrees in those fields and PhDs in those fields. Well. Here we are on Capitol Hill, and so I'm tempted to try and draw out some of the public policy implications of what these three impressive young people have said to us. So let me ask the first question. Samantha, you, you noted that you discovered that there is more than one cultural industry in China. Surely you, in the back of your mind you were making analogies to the United States. If you were the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the culture czar in the United States, how would you go about um, encouraging the development of our cultural industries and museums and the performing arts and so forth? When we were doing the research in China, that was something that was kind of constantly on our minds, was how does this compare to what we've seen and what we've grown up with as American citizens? Um, living um, and growing up very close by a lot of historic landmarks and near Baltimore, um, I had seen firsthand you know, Fort McHenry and you have a lot of the different um, the different war landmarks. Those are a lot of what I grew up with. Um, and then, you know, coming into D.C., like, we would always harken back to D.C. But interestingly, we also got a lot of um, analysis and contrast to Dollywood in Tennessee. I had never heard of Dollywood before. And then I went to Nashville, and it's a big thing. So if you ever go there, be prepared. Um, it is this theme park that Dolly Parton, like the singer Dolly Parton, uh, pushed forward um, to help s try and stimulate the economy, like the local economy of that hometown where she like came from. And we ended up, um, one of the uh, people, one of the, my fellow students on the research team uh, was from near that area and kept drawing all these allusions to Dollywood, comparing all of the different cultural industries of what China was doing to Dollywood, the commercialization and the different ways that they were 
like selling their culture versus how Dollywood was selling the southern culture, which very interesting experience if you're not from the south. Can't recommend it enough. Um, and so in doing that, um, for me, what I kind of got more out of it was not so much what can we do domestically, but what we could do internationally to make our culture more accessible. Because that was something that really struck me about China's cultural industries. Just because the, the, um, the Chinese people could connect with it didn't mean that the international tourists could. And with the way the world is, the more and more interconnected we are, it's becoming more and more important to make it accessible to other cultures. So I think that in moving forward, it's not only important to emphasize what we're doing here in America, but how what we're doing in America is going to be received abroad. Great answer. Um, you mentioned that in China, they, a lot of the effort is promoting the classical Chinese literature. In this country, we promote the study not only of American culture, but of all cultures mm -hmm. in the name of international understanding, which is remarkable. Peter, question for you. The theme of your remarks in a word is teams. You were motivated to go to college because of a soccer team. You found in your education a lot of emphasis on interaction among students and with faculty in a small college setting. And then of course you had the experience uh, through this project that was all about teams. What, uh, what lessons do you draw from that? Should education be mostly about educating the individual or should we always be focusing on teams? Yeah, I, I think it's important, and th thanks for the question, I, I think it's important that both are addressed. Um, and, and for me, it's easy to draw back to soccer because I, I've done so much of it over my life. Um, I've taken a job, I'm moving to Colorado, I'm working with an academy in Colorado for, for a couple years before I go back to school, um, a soccer academy. And, you know, the importance of the individual is huge to the, to the team. Um, you know, a lot of the time that I spent growing up was working on my own game to be able to give something to the group. Um, and then when you get in that group, the ability to understand what you don't necessarily do well, but your buddy does, is what makes everything. It's, it, 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 it's the most important thing, I think. And uh, that's easily transferred to the education system, I believe, you know? I think that kids need to be focused on their own, on their own education but when we get to the real world, and like I learned in this project working with Barry Plastics, you're always working with somebody. And if you aren't able to work with somebody, you're gonna get fired, you're not gonna get the job done. Somebody else is gonna beat you. And uh, to be competitive, you have to be able to take the things that you do well and fit them into a group. I think that's the most important thing. Um, looking forward and, and to my future and to the future of, of a lot of other young people. Great. Evan, you've probably had the most interdisciplinary experience of all of us here today in what you've been involved with the decathlon. Of those uh, general education courses, the ones in the liberal arts, which ones were most important to you and why? Um, <laughs> I think actually I mentioned it that I took a philosophy course and while that didn't have a direct connection to any of my pragmatic communications, advertising, and public relations coursework, it did force me to access and to wrap my head around these very nuanced perspectives that were all aimed at understanding reality. They brought in certain parts of communication theory in certain perspectives. And just from the rigor of that, having to write them out, in the, the way that the class was uh, structured, we all had to, uh, it wasn't like we have here. It was actually a circle of chairs around in the professor was just one link in that chain around that circle and we would have these group discussions and we would try to persuade each other why one philosopher might have had a more holistic approach or might have had the better understanding of whatever stance it was at the time and the professor would often say to us these kinds of classes will teach you how to think critically and while that might not do lead directly to a job any job that you take on after this you will be better at and I absolutely agree with him. Great answer. I was always scared of philosophy. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> I think um, we might open the uh, 
the floor to anyone who wants to ask a question and engage these three young people. Nancy? And yeah. Rich, just for the video, would you repeat the question when, from the oh, audience? Oh, sure. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for your presentations. Um, it brings to mind something I thought about a long time ago, which is just when I thought I was winning the rat race along come faster rats. And clearly you guys are a team of people who are going to do great things in this world. Um, I was, one of the things I found interesting is um, each of you, whether you do it or not, presented at one point of your experiences that all the pieces kind of fell together, your education, your life experiences, what have you, and how you use that to utilize that to move forward in the projects you're talking about. I'm a little curious about the, not so much the aha moment, but the oh no moment. Have you found, or maybe you could share with everybody, that moment during these projects where you knew that you were a lot of your depth? Sorry about that. <laughs> and how you use the toolbox that your universities provided you of education experiences and, and what have you, how you circumvented that, that problem or you addressed it? So I have to repeat the question? Not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me try. For for the audience back home or whatever. Um, a lot of you have talked about the aha moment, about how all the pieces came together. The question is, what about the oh no moment? <laughs> yeah, uh, we definitely had several oh no moments. When we were, multiple nights, we realized how much money we'd have to raise to build a solar powered home that wasn't going to make anybody else any money. So we had to time and time again reach out and create sponsorship deals. So it was just a simple matter. We had a website and a, lo a lo we had a website and we had social media. So we had to figure out how to make these shout outs carry some kind of weight and heft to them. And um, I mean, it was it was expensive to build a house like that. So our oh no moments came when we were like, great, that was you know twenty thousand dollars. How much do we have left? So, uh, and then the way that we would get over that, every time our professors were so so positive and so brought so much of that just like uh, unwavering can-do kind of spirit to it, and said every time to, ev said to us every time we were freaking out over something, you can do this. We can figure out a way to make this happen. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I really think the adaptability is key um, when you're even embarking on a project of any sort, um, things very much fell into place for going to China and conducting research abroad, but uh, the State Department, that was an adventure because when I initially applied to work at the State Department, I applied for a bureau um, that was specializing in East Asia and Pacific Affairs because that was what my background was in. Um, the way it worked out though, I got the security clearance, but I didn't end up in the office that I was you know, I had the background in. I ended up in a completely different office that offered an entirely new field of knowledge, field of research that I had never heard of before. I had never really had the chance to learn or engage with this material as the Office of Global Food Security, which you can imagine, that's a pretty hefty undertaking. Um, but in taking, you really have to take every single curveball that's thrown at you in stride and you know, rise to the occasion as much as you possibly can. I learned more than I ever thought I would sitting in that office and reading academic journals and different news briefings day in and day out, eight to five, just trying to keep up. And it turned out to be a much more challenging experience than I think I would have gotten had I ended up where I knew more of what I was doing. So I think that can kind of be applied in any say any kind of circumstances that you come in, whether it's on the job um, or even just in getting the job, being ready and being willing to take on whatever is going to be thrown at you, whether it's a specific task or just an entirely new position. That's really the key to making it. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Similar to Evan, you know, I there were many times um, that I was like, oh, how, is, how am I ever going to be able to do this, you know? Because the other thing was is that we were, working for, we were working for a Fortune 500 company. And, you know, I, we were looking into acquiring a company in Indonesia. And oh my goodness, there's so much that goes into acquiring a company. Like, you have to know everything about the culture and about the market and everything. And so the amount of research that we had to do was astronomical. Um, and so I guess two, two really oh no moments resonate with me. Um, the first was, you know, we, we were giving a practice presentation um, over our, our research. We had to have a 30 to 40 page report 
corporate report. So we had finished that, and then we had we were working on the end of our slideshow or presentation. Um, we were Shark Tanked. Um, Jill Griffin, who is amazing, Dr. Kazee, the president of our university who's here, um, will attest to this, I believe. She runs the Global Institute or the Global Inter Institute of Global Enterprise in Indiana, and that's what GAP was under. Um, and so she, she brought in uh, a Starbucks executive who watched our presentation, and I got through the second sentence, and she was like, that's not good. And we did the whole presentation, and it took us about two hours to get through it. And you know, at the end of it, all of us were kind of like, this lady, she doesn't know how hard we've worked on this. Um, she didn't do any of the research, what does she know? And then it took a second, you know, it was our baby, but it took a second for us to step back and look at it and say, okay, well, we're gonna use some of this, and we did, and I'm glad that we did that. And I think that's a testament to the liberal arts education system as well, is okay, here's an outside perspective, maybe it means something. So that was one, and, and taking some of, those, some of those recommendations really helped us. And I think the last one was, uh, the second one was um, the night before. Oh my goodness, the night before. It was 4 a.m. before I went to bed. I had a presentation at 8, but uh, you know, I had Geelong was, a, was the Indonesian individual. He did a fantastic job throughout the project, did all the finances, was an accounting guy. But I was going through his report, and it just occurred to me, his section of the report, oh no, English is his second language. So I was up very late that night um, working on every graph and everything else. Um, but with the help of, again, team, teamwork comes into play again. I had the help of one of, the other, one of the other team members, and she was absolutely amazing. So yeah, I mean, there were definitely, oops, there were definitely some oh no moments. Um, but I think, that's it, oh no, yeah. Um, I think getting through that really shows the resilience and the importance of being able to, to get through hard times, and, and we were able to do that. Other questions? You know, we talk a lot in uh, our kind of college about the transformational experience, that you come in thinking you want to do one thing with your life, and you are exposed to some things you've never been exposed to before, and you end up graduating and pursuing a life and a career in directions that you couldn't have anticipated when you were 17 years old and just thinking about colleges. Now, the way some of you told the story, those nudges in new directions didn't come by your deliberate choices. They came because you were confronted by circumstances that you had to contend with. What's been the balance between your choosing to go in new directions and your being overtaken by events and the serendipity of opportunities. Evan, you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, I, so I actually started out at a, a state school and uh, I liked it, but it was, I, I felt like I had just been pulled into it. Um, it was in my hometown. Uh, I knew some people that had gone there. I liked them, I respected them. Um, and then I felt kind of lost within the, the system and, and I couldn't, there was just some, some thing that wasn't there that, I, that I, I wanted within my education, some something, I didn't know what it was until I went to a liberal arts institution and I realized what I wanted was teamwork. I wanted students who respected other people's opinions and valued them and wanted to learn from them. And when I went to a school where that was like baked into the entire system. Um, the professors advocated for it. The students had uh, long since been caught up in that. Uh, I, I knew that that's what I had been missing the entire time. The decision to go there was very deliberate. After I toured and met some professors, that was a deliberate decision. Getting caught up in it was definitely me losing myself in the serendipity. It, it turned it out to be it turned out to be way better than I had even foreseen it going after my first uh, year at Drury. I was um, very fortunate to grow up in a very unique household, um, a STEM family, um, tried and true. The parents are here and looking at me like, oh, <laughs> I'm gonna be in trouble after this. Um, but when I started out, I used to say up and down, I'm gonna be a princess engineer. That's what I'm gonna do when I grow up. 
Um, but what really helped um, with you know getting ready to go to college and getting ready to pursue my own career was that nothing was ever off the table. Um, as much as there's a technical background in my family, there's just as much of an emphasis on other sorts of disciplines, other sorts of fields of study. Um, there's really never been a, why would you want to do that? That's not going to take you anywhere. Because if you have the right mindset, if you can put forth the right enthusiasm, you can really get yourself anywhere you need to go. Um, it's just a matter of you know relying on you as the individual to push for it. You can study what you want to study. You can apply yourself where you want to apply yourself. It's just a matter of how are you going to make that work for you. Um, and in doing that, in, you know, when I got to uh, school at Belmont, it was kind of, I don't want to call it a free-for-all of adding things, but I kind of just sort of tacked things on as I went. Um, but when I first arrived, I knew I wanted to do the honors program because I liked the idea of a more engaging, comprehensive curriculum that was going to take the gen ed requirements just up a level. It was going to require me to do a lot more information processing and you know, prepare me for more education beyond what you would normally expect at an undergraduate level. Um, but I had one semester of Chinese under my belt, and I thought, yeah, let's add a minor. Why not? It's a very valuable language. The UN thinks so. I think so, too. And so just continuing to add on and seeing the value of different disciplines, not only in my own household where I can see how just, just how valuable it is to have that background in you know, a more technical science, how it complements really well with having a background in, like Evan says, philosophy or what have you. It's, they all come together and they can all come together very well. And it's not necessarily finding you know, a way to where like, you're told where to go as it is finding the balance of what you're told with what you think. It's a very unique play of dynamics there. I've got a fairly similar story as Samantha. Um, I'm also from a STEM family. Both of my parents are geologists, which was very unique. My brother's an engineer. Um, and uh, I guess two things were, I, like I said in my talk, you know, I was coming to Evansville for one thing. I got recruited to play soccer. Well, I had known my whole life. My parents were geologists, and um, really, math, science were always very important, as were other subjects, though. You know, I, it was. It was important, you know. We are a music family as well. My, all our family plays instruments, so there's a, there's a second side of it as well. Um, but I went to Evansville to visit. I went on scholarship day, uh, engineering scholarship day, because I thought I was going to be an engineer. And I went in, and uh, this was when I was in high school, uh, senior of high school, and I didn't want to disappoint my dad because he, you know, he always wanted me to do that sort of thing. I thought, well, he didn't really care. It turns out. Um, but he didn't care what I did. Um, but uh, I remember coming home and I went up to my mom and I was like, I, I can't be an engineer. And she goes, well, duh. Uh, and uh, so from then, you know, I really hit the jackpot with, with my parents, you know, you know, letting me try things. And so I went to school and tried out what I was interested in. And, uh, you know, and the other part was that, you know, I was a political science major only my first two years. And um, we got into some of the, the, the campaign finance class. It was really, really interesting to me. It was really cool. Um, and so I was like, well, well, maybe I can learn a little bit more about finance. So I took a finance class. And then I took a, a corporate, corporate Ameri uh, the ID 150, which is corporate America class. And I absolutely loved it. Um, and then I was like, I'll pick up a business major. So yeah, just kind of things happened. It picked what I thought looked cool. and learn something from it. You three clearly took advantage of the resources that were available to you at your institutions. You have now motivated your president, uh, Tom Gazee, to rise to the occasion. Tom, question? I'm, I'm really intrigued by the notion, uh, for want of a better term, discovery of what the liberal arts can mean. And I connect back to a challenge most of us in that sector face. And that is, how do we communicate to students who are prospective students that this is what can happen? So it's, you, you kind of touched on this several of Samantha, maybe you were the one who came closest to suggesting you had a kind of consciousness of the potential of liberal arts. And then you started out at State University, Peter. Soccer was a motivator for you. So 
And yet, all three of you have discovered the remarkable things that can happen in institutions like this. So, liberal arts for you now is something not to be too colloquial, you get. Yeah. But I worry that prospective students often don't. When I walk into a meeting of prospective students and their parents, I'm not even sure they fully understand what liberal arts means. This is the art of living child. So, do you now that you, the three of you have been through the experience, do you have advice for us about how we can better communicate to prospective students the kinds of experiences that you have, have benefited from? Let me try and phrase that one. Uh, <laughs> um, the liberal arts, are, at least as exemplified here, are uh, an experience in discovery of new knowledge and new fields. How can colleges do a better job of communicating the value of the liberal arts and the experience of discovery to prospective students? Keep the same pattern? Yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah. <laughs> That's a really tricky question. Um, I know that the things that motivated me going into college are very different than the things that motivated me when I was leaving college. The things that I think to, if you want to reach out to seniors in high school, and not only them, but their parents, those are two different audiences with very different interests and goals sometimes. Um, but I think maybe if you want to have a message that could appeal to both, you can say the liberal arts are not only a way to get a job. It's also a great way, or you know, the order might be different. Maybe the first is it's not only a great way to leave, live a more fulfilled life to get everything out of the short time that we have. This is also a great way to become a dynamic problem solver, well-rounded, no matter what it is. And you can specialize within your liberal arts institutions. You're absolutely going to get a chemistry degree or a business degree or a political science degree. But you can also learn these other auxiliary, this other auxiliary information that will make your experience richer as a student. Um, you have to juggle both the student's desire for a rich experience and an exciting time in college and the parents are urging or like urgent pressing need to find a route for their child to become gainfully employed. I think looking at um, just the different marketing strategies it's important to keep in mind what Evan mentioned how you know you want to make a way that you can appeal to both the parents and the potential students because it is a different audience you need to really cater to that. Um, but that being said, I think it's important to really emphasize the, um, the potential in um, generalizing oneself. The, the terminology that I always like to use is um, jack of all trades or Jane of all trades, like either or. That is something that always speaks very well to someone. It's used as a compliment in most contexts because it's speaking to someone's ability to be versatile. And I read, I remember my freshman year, my um, honors professor assigned an article that a friend of hers wrote as Hope Work. It's just a short little article about a liberal arts education and why you should, you know, you should be proud of what you're embarking on as a freshman, you know, at a liberal arts school. And what this article talked about, it was really, really profound. I really enjoyed it, and that's probably why I remember it now. Um, he drew on um, the liberal arts core as kind of like a Swiss army knife. Um, you have a lot of different options with what you can do with it once you get there, but what you do with it really relies on what you want to do and where your talents lie and how you want to um, complement those with other people in different teamwork settings and such um, kind of uh, circumstances that are going to call on you to be an individual and a team player at the same time. So I think that, you know, in pushing for marketing toward prospective students in particular, showing that, you know, when you take on a liberal arts degree, you're not taking on just one area of study. You're not taking on one ideal job in mind. You're taking on the possibilities of endless opportunity. You just have to decide where that's going to lead you personally. Uh, for me, I think that a really good way to go about it is, is reach, reaching out. And I think a lot of, a lot of the, and obviously resources are, are important to be able to do that. And a lot, and a lot of universities are, are doing a good job of reaching out. 
but I think reaching out into the communities that you're in um, and also reaching out to, to the businesses that, sh that you work with or the organizations that you work with, doing things like this is very important. Um, because the more that liberal arts universities are seeing the limelight, um, the more attractive they're going to be. And people can see, oh, they're doing this. I could do that. These kids can see that. And, and, and the other thing is that just showing them that I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty normal kid sitting up here, really. So, and, and I'm getting to do this. So, show them that. Um, give them, give them a dream to look forward to. And you know, a normal kid can do some pretty cool stuff through this. Um, and, you know, it's just. I think the other thing is that I don't think we've really talked about this. I think that just the social aspect of a liberal arts university is so much fun. It's the more that you can portray that to those kids, um, the more attractive it's going to be. Great. You know, the data s support the view that liberal arts graduates do just fine getting jobs. And uh, things change from the first job right after graduation to what it looks like five years later or ten years later. Uh, the most recent figures for uh, petroleum engineers would have them starting out the highest possible salaries, but with the um, with the situation in the oil industry right now, you wonder how many petroleum engineers are going to be employed at high salaries for the next few years. So things change. Things change. Question? Yes. It seems like all three of you have background which is kind of privileged. You came from education background. Mm -hmm. You have experiences before going to college which allowed you to take advantages of situations that you're there. First generation students, when they come to college, they have no idea. They don't know what these experiences do for you. How do you have them engage so that they can take advantage of the experiences that the colleges offer? Mm -hmm. The question was uh, observing that our speakers today have come from backgrounds that have been uh, fairly advantaged. And the question then is, how do these colleges and universities make the experience for students who are new to the college culture, first generation students, uh, how, how help them take advantage of what the institutions have to offer? I'm going to uh, ask the students to respond, then I'm going to ask some of the presidents in the room to respond. So. Um, one thing that we do at Drury is we have what we call in the dorms for the freshmen, these living learning communities where you sort out into different batches, small handfuls of students that, you know, so it's not so big that you might feel lost in the crowd or anonymous. And part of that is the fact that we're a small school so we can do things like that, but you can always break things down into smaller groups no matter how many people there are. So that's not an issue. That is. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> But those living learning communities really can help. I mean, anyone, I, I can't deny my own, my own privilege. Both of my parents were highly educated. It wasn't a question that it was going to happen. Um, but for someone where it is, the, the, and from the students that I've talked to who were in that kind of boat as I went through, they were, the thing that was missing wasn't the education. It wasn't going in and talking to a professor and getting grade work. They needed to feel a sense of social place because that's what was missing. And so if you have uh, designated leaders within, I mean, it can be the dorm managers, but then you also have to think about, well, maybe they aren't living off on campus. Uh, a lot of students at Drury don't live off on campus. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're reaching out to every kind. So like the commuter students, everyone gets pulled in, uh, and it's just flyers on the wall sometimes. Sometimes it's personal letters in mailboxes, emails, phone calls, just a little personal flair from the administration. Mm -hmm. For the past three years, um, I've been employed as a resident assistant um, in a freshman dorm. So I work with first year students almost entirely. Um, sometimes I get pulled over to help out with different things and the other dorms. Um, but on the whole, I work with first year students and that has happened a lot um, where I am, I think, fortunate enough to kind of get to share in creating that community of learning. Um, I love the idea that Evan was talking about that his university does in creating the smaller groups. Um, that kind of falls more on the RA to identify those students as people who, you know, they're here and that's a tremendous step. And to keep them here, to keep them motivated, it's going to take 
an extra, um, or it could take some extra advice, some extra um, resources in terms of making sure that they feel that they belong here, because they do. Um, you can see, I've seen with the students that I've worked with, a tremendous work ethic and a tremendous can-do attitude that really distinguishes them from their peers. Um, it's been a pleasure to really get to engage with them so much and, and doing things very similar to what Evan was talking about. Um, we have uh, prescribed, the Office of Residence Life has a very uh, structured uh, way in which that we plan programs for the students to interact not only with their dorm communities, but outside of the dorms within the community as a whole. We like to take it into um, a more service-based uh, kind of learning experience. We don't want to just keep it in the university on the campus. That's a big thing for the first year students because you know when you, you get there, a lot of them don't have cars and they'll, they'll just stay pretty close to campus. Um, we want to take them out in the world and we want them to show not only what they're capable of, but themselves, what, what they're capable of when they're surrounded by people who are going to lift them higher and invest in them just as much as they need it. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to kind of echo what, what Evan said, really, um, and kind of throw in my experience at the University of Evansville as well. Uh, University of Evansville is pretty unique in that we have a very high percentage of international students. I mean, they're there are, there's, a, there's a high number of Saudi Arabians, especially, um, who come over and, and come in and work in engineering predominantly. Um, but then again, you know, one of the people that I've had a lot of class with is a Syrian fellow, and he's brilliant. Um, I, I think the social aspect of it is the most important, showing them that their worth at our university is very important. And um, you know, I, I think that kind of stems from the University of Evansville. We, had, we were ranked the top school for study abroad in the country this, this year. Uh, we have a sister college in England called Harlexton College. Um, absolutely astounding place. It's, it's beautiful, it's unbelievable in the countryside in Grantham, England, I believe. Um, through that, we've kind of been able to reach out and, and touch the international community. And we see that as they come in. Um, and just getting to know some of, some of those people and, and showing them that we do respect their perspective um, is, I think, key. The other, the other aspect of that is, all, again, I'm going back to soccer here, but um, soccer is the international game. And uh, as a member of the soccer team, we always reached out to the Brazilians. We always reached out to all of those kids because they were the ones at our games, and they loved it, and they were hooping and hollering and yelling and cheering, and um, we tried to make them a part of what we had, and I think that really helped them engage in, in, in the, get engaged in the university. Great. One of the presidents want to get in on this and answer the question? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, for John, I'll just offer an observation. I think one of the real challenges is a perception on the part of first generation students, minority students, and others, uh, about affordability. Can, can they, once they have all the things you've talked about, the kind of building, kind of social capital, uh, making folks feel valued for who they are, all of that applies, but if you don't get them there, you've got a challenge, and, and our, our model, our pricing model, is a real, uh, creates real difficulties for us, because we typically have high sticker prices. And folks don't understand the, the very substantial amount of financial aid that we offer, which when combined with things like Pell Grants in the state of Indiana, we have a, a fairly generous state assistance grant for students from Indiana. It, it can become at least as affordable as the options and sometimes more affordable. If they don't know that, then we're, we're, we're not ever going to put them in a situation where they'll benefit from everything we've been talking about. If I can um, just add some statistics to that. The uh, percentage of low-income and first-generation students at private colleges and universities at entering time is about the same as it is at public four-year universities. But if you look at the graduation statistics, first of all, all students, including the first-generation students, graduate faster and at higher rates at private institutions. And they, uh, 
have the same amount of debt. Now in an ideal world, no one would have any debt, but the difference between the graduates of the private institutions and the public institutions is very close, very close indeed. Yes? Is um, the diversity, because of the diversity, because of the pressure, the parents with pressure, maybe you have to be in an area where you have a secure job because college is expensive, and the idea of being the first generation, you may have pressure of taking care of your younger siblings, so that becomes a, a demand for you. So you tend to not be open minded, you're narrow minded, you focus on one thing and only, and that's what you want to achieve compared to others where they have like more freedom to do what to choose and they uh, international students are like focused, they tend to focus on one area. So the best way to reach out to them is like to give them an idea of what kind of job you can get. For me, example, I'm a French major. Uh, sometimes people ask me, what do you do with French? Where do you do that? I was like, yeah, I'm trying to find that as, as, I, as I go with it. So, the problem is they want to know what's the job, what can they gain from just, not just go to college and get an education, but what type of job can you have? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, giving them the parents an idea that lift up a little bit the pressure on the kids. And, and off of that, I think it's important that, to mention that something that I've learned while at my time in the University of Evansville is that it's okay to not necessarily know what you're going to do next. You're going to figure it out. It's going to happen. And, and that's something that I think needs to be, and this can go back to our second, or first, the question before this is that let the kids know that it's okay to come in and try things and see what you like. Yes, sir. This question really uh, brings in focus the whole value of liberal arts, education, small classes, faculty engaged with students one-on-one, -on -one, uh, interdisciplinary studies within the curriculum, uh, uh, and, a, and a sense of purpose that we try to challenge our students to know that you're here for a reason. What is it? Why, the why question? Sort of their aha moments. I don't think that it's that different for students who maybe already have been programmed to think. I mean, it may be easier if you've not been programmed to think, here's what I'm supposed to do in my life, uh, than it is for a lot of students who come in and say, my dad wants me to be an accountant, but I want to be a elementary school teacher. <laughs> and, we, and, and you observe as they talk to the two of you. They talk about being a county of brown and referring to brown. And they talk about teaching kids and smile. And, and you reflect that to them. And, and they say, Would you call my dad and tell him? No. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, but those moments, uh, I don't know that there are any. I think that the challenge of getting the students there and bringing them in, you know, embracing them, that's the challenge. But, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Troy and. That's um, that's there's almost no correlation in our school uh, between that and race or ethnicity. That's those those first generation students are, are distributed very proportionally across white Caucasian and all uh, minorities that are represented in our institution. And the uh, the advantage and the reason that schools uh, like ours graduate those students at a higher rate, which are that that first year experience, our our institutions. I know I'm speaking for for all of us here put so much effort into that transition uh, into what to college and, and these mm -hmm. students that are first generation they, 
they don't know how to do college, you know, uh, like students that are coming from mm -hmm. families with both parents uh, highly educated. So those FYE experiences, at least that's what we call it at our institution, that, um, that kind of help bridge the gap for those students and, and get them up and running in their academics as well as in their social communities like our, uh, our presenters have talked about is so critical. And then that continues through their four years uh, at our institution, you know, a, a very efficient kind of online early alert system, we call it. When, whether it's a, a faculty member, a professor, uh, a, a, an RA, uh, fellow students, I mean, if, if a, a problem is arising, there's a very efficient and early way to kind of make that known so that the student uh, gets help and, and doesn't disappear into the cracks and get lost and, and, uh, and fall away. So uh, I think that's a, it's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, I think that's uh, part of the benefit of some of the things that Bob and some of the others have talked about in terms of that engagement with our, our professors in the community that the students enter into. A resource for those of you who are interested in the question of the success of first generation students is a publication that now lives on the CIC website, which is the result of a, a $5 million grant from the Walmart Foundation that tracked 50 institutions that were doing an exemplary job of having first generation students succeed in college and graduate in timely fashion. I think you find the techniques, uh, some of which are like those Troy mentioned, uh, very uh, uh, stimulating. Nancy, what do we have time for? One more question? One more question. And it's got to end with a rhymed couplet. <laughs> so, so, okay. Oh, that, that killed it. I'm sorry. Okay. No rhyme couplets. One more question. Different subject, perhaps. Well, uh, Troy? Sure. Yeah. An addendum of sorts. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Troy talked about this, the touch of um, affordability and completion, which are really very important parts of the national conversation right now. Schools like the NACNU school are more affordable in part because our students typically graduate in four years. Right. And so when you add the financial assistance that's offered, to timely graduation, which is part of that completion agenda, the total amount of commitment that a family makes is really quite modest relative to what they might make if those students went to schools where they weren't graduating in four years and they were getting less financial assistance. Yes. That's probably one of the least understood aspects of schools like that. Yeah, I think you're right. And an awful lot of that financial assistance is not coming from the taxpayers, it's coming from private donors, institutional aid. So there, there are a number of public policy questions embedded in this. We know this form of education works really well, produces very talented and productive graduates and citizens. It's cost effective, both for the individual and for state and federal government, but it's relatively small scale. And these days, the assumption is that only large scale can be efficient. And I think what you have demonstrated at the NACU colleges is that small scale can also be very cost effective. So the public policy question is how do we make this lesson known so that this approach is much more prominent in the landscape of American higher education? I wanna thank uh, our speakers. They're just terrific testimony today. And Nancy, back to you. Well, I want to thank Rich for um, moderating this session and also for the work that you're doing um, to get the message out that this kind of education is, is affordable. It does lead to degree completion and it's a very important part of what we're trying to do as we continue to build our society. And so thank you for that. And, uh, you know, the, the students that we have to hear today, I think they really give me hope for the future because when we see young people who are as thoughtful, articulate, and committed to what they're doing as these three students, and I think our other students at home on their campuses, um, I don't think the United States is in trouble. I think we're going to be um, on the road to where we want to be, continuing to, to be a great place to live in a great country. So thank you very much. And I want to thank also the faculty and the presidents that are here because you're the ones that help these students to develop the skills and abilities and passion that they're going to take out into the world. And finally, to thank um, our Representative Cooper from 
and Nashville and Justin Tooley for helping us with this space and for all of you for coming and participating in this discussion. So thank you especially for coming out on a day that's freezing and still freezing <laughs> here. So thank you very, very much.